Hello, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar on data ethics. What is it, and why does it matter? We have two fantastic speakers lined up, but before I get to introductions, and while there are still a few people connecting, I'll get started on some housekeeping. So I expect we're all pretty used to Zoom meetings, but I wanted to let you know that for this one, we're using a webinar format, which means that your videos and microphones are off, so you don't need to worry about muting yourselves. Having said that, we'd still really love to hear from you, so feel free to say hello and where you're joining us from using the chat button at the bottom of your screen. And you can also use the chat button to share comments throughout the webinar. Can I also get everyone to have a look for the Q&A button that's next to the chat bubble? The Q&A button is the one to use to post questions for our speakers. We encourage everyone to post questions as they come to you throughout the webinar, and we will direct your questions to your speakers at the end. As a final housekeeping note, we are recording this session, and we will send a link out in an email next week along with any links or supporting material from our speakers. So with the housekeeping done, we're ready to get started for real. Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's webinar on data ethics. What is it and why does it matter? The topic for today was inspired by the United Nations Day of Conscience and what does that mean in a data world? I'm your host, Veronica Coyle from Data for Good, and I'm speaking today from the lands of the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation. My behind the scenes host, Samantha, is joining from the lands of the Darwal Nation. Together, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands from which we are gathering today. We pay our respects to the elders of these lands, past, present, and emerging. I'll take a moment to introduce Data for Good. So we are a not-for-profit organization whose mission is to inspire and enable people so that we can use our skills and passion to benefit humanity. Our webinar series is one way that we do that, but we also connect volunteers with data skills with not-for-profits that have data projects, which means that the not-for-profits can focus more on providing services that benefit people and the planet. So we have two fabulous speakers for today. Let me first introduce Teresa Derndorfer Anderson, who is a social informaticist and data and AI ethicist. For over 20 years, her award-winning work as an educator and researcher has engaged with the ever-evolving relationship between people and emerging technologies when working with data and making decisions. Teresa contributes to government, industry, and NGO efforts advancing socially just data policies and building processes for gaining and maintaining a community's trust in data and AI use. She is Vice Chair of the Australian Computer Society here in New South Wales and sits on the New South Wales Government's inaugural Artificial Intelligence Advisory Committee. Plus, she contributes to several international initiatives related to data sharing. Also speaking today is Dorothea Baljevic, who has been in IT for over 10 years, starting her career as a system engineer and who has held roles in delivering business outcomes and change through leading large technology and data teams. Currently, she is building the international data science practice at Len Lease. Dorothea has degrees in information technology, a master of business and technology management, and a master of data science and innovation, where she spent a year studying computational neuroscience in Berlin. And it was during this time that she discovered a deep interest in the organic processes of decision-making. She's exploring this further in her role at lend -Lease and in her PhD work with a focus on ethical decision-making. Dorothea and Teresa, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. And I will hand over to you to begin the discussion. Thank you very much for that very warm introduction. It's a delight to be here and, and especially to share the stage with Dorothea, 
who, who was, while she was a Master of Data Science and Innovation student, uh, a student of mine and has gone on to do these amazing, awesome things. So it's, it's, a, it's a joy to be able to share the stage with her now as a friend and colleague. And before I go any further, I too would like to pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the lands on which we are meeting today. I am at the moment sitting on Gadigal land and I pay my respects to all those elders past, present and emerging. To start off with, I, I wanted to share this, this statement. So given that the focus today is inspired by uh, the ideas of the International Day of Conscience, this extract is a really powerful way to get our minds focused on thinking about data ethics the way that Dorothea and I will share this today. That when the majority of people are following their conscience and are dedicating themselves to spreading love, fostering coexistence, regardless of, of differences that one might have, and using wisdom for the purposes of resolving conflicts, this, the hope is, will inspire others to act similarly. Uh, and that will lead to, to a better world for all of us. And I, I think that's a lovely sentiment. And it's one that, that we'll come back to um, through the theme that we're introducing today. Uh, and with that, I'd like to turn over to Dorothea and let her uh, introduce herself and this topic of data ethics as well. Thank you, first of all, to the introductions already done by Veronica and Teresa. I feel like I don't need to do too much more myself, but very happy to be part of this conversation today. And the biggest part of kicking a conversation around data ethics is, well, what is it? And thank you for sharing a lot of why you all wanted to attend to this. Most of you wanted to understand a little bit more about data ethics or actually enrich, enhance the conversation that you already are having in your respective organizations. And one of the nicest and most concise definitions that both Teresa and I have found has actually come from a think-do tank in Europe, aptly named data ethics. And their concise definition actually talks about the sustainable and responsible use of data, or what we like to refer to as data practice. They add on top of that, that it's doing the right thing for people and society. What's really nice is when we were looking at the curtain raiser as part of data for good, it's a similar principle because Veronica was sharing, it's about handling or tackling community and global issues. Now, this think tank has five principles that underpin data ethics, including human being at the center, individual data control, which we saw being led by the GDPR, transparency, what's being done, accountability and equi equality. But still at the core is doing no harm or doing the right thing. So what does that actually look like? What is good? Which is what Therese is going to talk about. So in our conversations, the conversations that Dorothea and I have been having uh, around this question of what, it, what is ethics, uh, and, and in the work that I've been doing in recent years, speaking about data and AI ethics, this idea of doing good and doing no harm uh, naturally comes up. And that, that raises the question of what does it mean to do good? Uh, and, and for that, I, I, I want to go back, way back, uh, to Aristotle's observations around ethics. And this notion that the good of, of, of a human being relates to really being human. And so this, this again connects to this notion of conscience and using your conscience because, because that, is, that is the source of our values and, and the life that we are living individually and collectively. And so this notion, uh, again, um, translated from, from this work from Aristotle, all knowledge uh, and, and every um, action aims to do some good and that raises the question, what do we mean by good? So it isn't enough to say I will do good or I will not do harm because there are still uh, clarifications that need to be made. And, and quite clearly one person's good may be very different from another, which is where the principles of participation and inclusivity are so critical to conversations around ethics. And I would argue, especially around data ethics as increasingly uh, data is, come, is coming to represent uh, people in, in these computational forms. So for us, uh, and, and the way that we love to, to share with you this idea of where data ethics sits as a, as, an in, as a way of doing good, I feel very strongly we need to be thinking about the pathways that will enable both human and planetary flourishing. So increasingly in the year 2021, we've become very 
very aware that it's not just about supporting uh, humanity and supporting um, human value, but recognizing the fragility of our planet and supporting flourishing uh, in this, this coexistence. I think it also means very strongly that, that we're looking to pursue uh, themes of data justice and human rights and looking at how to articulate that. So not just speaking to that, but defining that and being very clear as to what we mean. And to do that, we also then need to remain alert and, and ever vigilant to thinking about what ought to be done. And, and that means not just following the law and following regulation, but again, turning to conscience, thinking, thinking about what, what our, our gut tells us, also being in, in um, pursuing education and pursuing awareness and sensitivity to others to think about that ought aspect. And the theme that, that I am particularly um, keen on, on sharing with you today is around this idea of making the invisible visible. Because uh, thinking, thinking deeply about something and raising your awareness and your alertness to the world around you is a way of opening your eyes to, to new understandings, the things that you may have taken for granted until your awareness has been set on that. And this is especially true around data. So I often uh, say in, in training sessions that I do that data does not speak for itself. It is indeed given a voice and the voice that it is given is shaped by the people that are working with that data. It's shaped by the algorithms that are increasingly playing these critical roles in the transformation of data into the insight and the actions that are used by us as individuals, organizations, governments. So making the invisible visible is, is is critical at this stage. And I'll, I'll refer here to a, a beautiful paper and we'll put the references together and some information for you after the webinar. Uh, I would definitely recommend this work by Kate Crawford and Donna Boyd uh, that, that talks about the critical questions for dealing with big data. And this notion of asking those difficult questions uh, before uh, practice crystallizes into new orthodoxies. I think that is really ethics is about asking questions. It's not always about having answers. In fact, I'd say it's not the answers at all. It's the process of inquiry that is so critical. And one of those key big questions that actually I was introduced in one of Teresa's classes is behind every single data point is a human being before it comes to your database, your data warehouse, your info sheet, your spreadsheet, wherever you're looking at it, it actually was accountable human, their behavior, their observation, their dynamics. So that means once you've got that and you're starting to analyze it, what's potentially being missed through the processing or the collection or who knows what the steps were behind that because you're definitely not doing the entire process from go to work. So what has unintentionally potentially been missed from the process that's occurred. What typically can occur is we see that there's a minority group, what we refer to in data as the outliers or the exceptions. And one decision can be, well, let's remove that or let's park that until we understand that group. However, what's actually happened to date with the advent of advanced machine learning, artificial intelligence, we use the data minus these exceptions and it gets accelerated into insights but those insights are biased. We've seen they're racist, they're bigoted, they're sexist, and we're accelerating that process because the algorithms can't tell us that there is a human being or group of human beings. And one thing this morning that actually Teresa had shared to me that I think is so wonderful that actually represents this. We've seen what's happening in India, unfortunately, with this COVID-19 pandemic. And one company, a glassware company called Borisol, acknowledged and recognized, and they made a statement on LinkedIn that said, we've lost four of our people. So there's a fact and figure, it's a number four, but they don't stop there. They name each of the individuals that have, were unfortunately lost their lives to COVID-19. They don't stop there either. They say that as a result of this, they need to go beyond that. These were human beings and what was the impact to their families? They're going to actually have two years of their salary given back to that family. And not just that, the children are going to be educated till graduation. They saw the number, they recognize the human beings, and that's what we're talking about. What are the questions we really need to answer and show through that? What can we try and remove the bias inequity through the data? 
And I think one of the things I loved as well in that in that um, post that was made this morning by Borisol is that there was a, a recognition by the organization that some of the organization's most valuable assets are not on their spreadsheet. They don't show up. The human values, the, the human talent that lies in an organization, and this is becoming very critical and very clear in many places right now where we're facing redundancies and uh, transformations of roles. So, so when we look at what is um, in the spreadsheet, in the leisure, is that, is that everything for which we should be held accountable? I love this statement from Alfred Krasinski uh, in 1933 to just remind us that these are not new problems. Uh, a map is not the territory it represents, but if correct, it has a similar structure, which accounts for its usefulness, but that also means it has a limitation. There's a difference between data realities and data simulations, and as we start to work more frequently with this notion of a digital twin, uh, and that could be a talk for a whole nother time and maybe in the conversation, I I think it's exciting to see the possibilities of working with data to help us to emulate the real world on our screen. But the map is not the territory. If we recognize that we do not have possibly all the data, then the map that we have has to be changed through our realizations and our understandings. That doesn't stop us from using the map. That doesn't stop us from using these digital representations, these data representations but we need to constantly remain alert to the fact that there may be aspects that are missing. There may be realizations and understandings that will only come to mind as we start to use that data, as we start to use that map in the same way that I'm sure many of you have had experiences where you're working with a map that seems fairly accurate. And it's only in the process of taking that journey with the map that you realize that there is something that wasn't recorded. And this is also a consequence of the complexity of, of working with, with multiple data sets and working with complex information. Because uh, with every layer of abstraction, we're going to gain time, we gain speed. The map doesn't cover everything, but it covers what is considered necessary. But that also means we've lost information. And if that information that we're losing relates to a human being, relates to a human value, relates to a group that, that um, are generally not as front of mind in a community as others, this is particularly critical with communities that are vulnerable, with, with communities that are not um, considered in the majority. And this is why as data professionals, we have to be so vigilant and so sensitive to the power that we are contributing to. And we'll actually be providing an example of where geolocational mapping goes wrong a little bit later. So just bear with us. So what Teresa was talking about around the data simulation and realities holds true. We still need to have some form of a representation and we try and make it simple as humans. We do that in forms of categorization. And there's this wonderful quote from Professor Buckingham Shum from University of Technology, Sydney, who actually provokes us on what happens in this categorization. He says the data points in a graph are tiny portholes onto a rich human world. They're proxy indicators that do not do justice to the complexity of real people. So if you haven't heard in the last few slides, Teresa and I are talking to you about how the dynamics of humans are extraordinarily complex. So it is fine for us to try and create these models of simplification through categorization, these mappings, but we need to understand by doing so, what are we potentially removing away from our insights? Are these assumptions be serving a purpose for the decisions we need to make, for putting a line in history? Do they actually serve that pur purpose for the future? Or how do they get adjusted? And I love what Teresa is about to present and where data categorization <laughs> over not the decades, we're talking about the centuries, has actually evolved into. So, so I'm going to restrain myself. So, so um, a little, little background here. I'm a trained librarian and I used to teach classification and classifications are incredibly powerful socio-technical mechanisms. And the, this particular example I'm going to share with you uh, was inspired by the work of Jeff Bowker and Susan Lee Starr. Uh, and again, I'll put that reference in the work because it, it raised my awareness to just how powerful a classification scheme can be. So at the moment, 
we are hearing a lot about, um, sadly, about the, the losses associated with COVID. Uh, we have, in a sense, a new kind of tally table where we're trying to look at how rampant is the disease in a community, how many deaths, um, how many ongoing concerns. And there are now growing categorization challenges around long COVID versus um, short term. So categorization matters when we're trying to determine the health of a community. So here's an example from the 17th century. This is a, a table of casualties. Uh, I think it's 1640, this particular one. And, and I'll leave you to read uh, a fuller story, which I'll share with you. But you'll notice a few things that are very historic. One can no longer die by wolf in, in England, but at that time there were deaths by wolf. One could die by of grief, which I find very co compelling. Uh, execution. Um, there's a, there are whole different categorizations, including the plague, that are part of this 17th century list. Uh, so it's a snapshot. It's a capsule of time. This tiny porthole. Uh, if you imagine now with big data sets and linking data over time, so longitudinally, how is the context of this particular table? So this is an exaggerated example in terms of big data, but, but if we were trying to understand climate, if we're trying to understand the improvement in human health, how do we get to a point of appreciating the context within which this material was collected? Now there are also politics that are part of this, which is why these are socio-technical mechanisms. So this um, international classification of disease table that, that first is, is, is about age and old age and uses, uses language that we wouldn't necessarily see in our social circles now. Senility, you'll see there's a classification of um, worn out. So, so your disease could be you're simply worn out. I'm very sensitive to that at the moment, you know, with, with knee injuries and joints. Uh, now, I'm going to bring it into the 21st century. So here, here is a discussion that um, was published in the UK around the ethical classification of chronic fatigue syndrome. And, and what it, what it um, recalls here is the debate around whether or not chronic fatigue is a psychological or mental health disorder, or if it is a biological um, disease. And that classification has powerful ramifications, not just in terms of research and how one finds this, it has consequences for the individual who is classed as either psychologically or, or in need of, of mental health support or has a physical illness. Uh, and so this paper then talks not so much just about that, but the differences in terms of the way it's classified in Britain as opposed to America and the ethical responsibilities that a doctor might have in terms of, of communicating these challenges to a patient. So again, there's that human aspect. One more example that I want to give that, that connects to work that I've done internationally. I'm part of a, an international organization looking at urban health and well-being. And uh, increasingly, the data sharing in these networks is, is also looking at ways to understand the impacts of climate change, the impacts of weather events. And we're looking at training uh, in, in these data sharing circles to ensure that, that we make as much visible as possible. These, these examples here that I'm putting um, up on the screen, and again, I'll provide proper links if you're interested. It, what I love is that the, the researchers in these examples, I think have done a stellar job at seeking to explain and share the, the raw data that, that they're working with uh, to come to the conclusions that, that they present in their papers. But what's more, they also show their hand in terms of how they've come to those conclusions. So they, so they explain the choice of statistical tools. They explain the way that they've worked with things. Regardless of that though, there, the red arrows point to something that, that is a contextual factor that, that caught my eye in large part because of a personal experience I had in the United States at a time when weather events were starting to be recognized as having impacts on the homeless in cities. So you'll notice in this particular paper, the table two, which I've provided here, uh, lists cause of death, causes of death, and the categorization says, okay, we're listing the causes of death where N is equal to or greater than five. So we know that there might be some causes of death that are not recorded here where human beings have, have lost their lives, but, but that classification is not recorded. Now, obviously limits have to be there, but you'll look here that there's this, this um, line that says cold related death, five. So it's just barely made 
this selection criteria. But now the reason this caught my eye is because the personal experience I had had uh, an awareness that uh, or my awareness was raised to a situation in a particular hospital in the United States. The, the city doesn't matter. But the issue was that here was a city where there was the, the government was becoming highly sensitive to the rate of, of um, exposure. So, so the way that homeless people in the winter months were suffering. It's not a good look for a city when you have people dying of exposure because they don't have a roof over their heads. Uh, and hospitals were discouraged from listing as primary cause of death, exposure or cold. So you would find people recorded um, the death, the cause of death, and it, and it is related. So possibly heart disease or flu or virus. Now, you know, it's also, I, I flag this because very often when one is in a situation that is an emergency, like recording a COVID death or re recording deaths in a hospital, your primary focus is on helping the individual in front of you. So the idea of record keeping is, is clearly secondary, but there are consequences further down the track when we seek to understand what has gone before and when we seek to use those tables as the source of truth. So that's the, the point to make there. It's not to not move forward, but it's to again, think about what might be missing or, or what could be behind, what politics or what, what, um, what pressures might um, have contributed to, to the number that I see before me. And so that's why really, uh, I feel very strongly it's important if we are talking about supporting human flourishing, supporting planetary for flourishing, we're not just talking about working with data where we have developed these amazing technical capacities. We need to develop and nurture our imaginative problem solving. We need to tap into our humanity. And so I think this involves creating a culture of care that is not just the technical know-how, it's, it's, it's this humanist approach. It's thinking about uh, ways, ways that we can be creative and inventive. It's, it's drawing on our compassion. It's making time to think, which is contemplation. It's seeking to stay connected to our communities and to those around us and to those who are vulnerable and those who may not um, be front of mind um, in, in our everyday conversation. It's seeking to draw on our conscience. And like Teresa mentioned, we are moving forward. And these are two, I think, great examples of where data is being turned around in this culture of care or true ethical you know, data practices. And the one on the left, it's a manifesto for data humanism. And, and I love it. This is just an extract and we will share the links where they've taken this red pen and they've pretty much crossed everything out where it says, for instance, big data. They've now made it small data. It's not about saving the time. We often hear data scientists spend 80% of the time just cleaning and processing. Yes, but it's also about spending the right time with the data to actually understand what is it that we need to make visible? Who are the humans being impacted by the decisions we're making on the cleaning and analysis processes? And I also quite like that they've actually squashed out data is not numbers, it's about people, it's the humans behind the scenes. And when you read through this manifesto, it's not just about scratching things out. They acknowledge there was a time and place for the beautiful data visualizations in infographics because it made it accessible to the general population to understand, okay, the beauty of data, there's a huge amount of power, but it shouldn't stop there because we're starting to see that people are doing this sometimes inadvertently for nefarious means, but also, excluding people in society to move forward ahead. So what they're saying is let's move it up. Let's make it meaningful. Let's make it thoughtful in what we're doing. Let's do that culture of care for data, what they refer to as the manifesto. And one practical example, we promised you an example around geolocation, is an example in 2013 in New York. There was researchers at Cambridge, Massachusetts, who decided to have a look at sentiment data using Twitter feeds. And they decided to use it from two years in the past to understand the history of what was going on. So sentiment meaning picking up words which they had negative connotations, feeling miserable, feeling sad versus positive connotations. They even looked at emoticons or I think you can semi use emojis there to figure out again, is it a plus or is it a minus? And doing the analysis, and so they picked a week, two years prior, 
to figure out where are the happiest or the saddest places. Happiest you might imagine is Central Park, you know, wonderful Greenland. So obviously everyone's taking photos day out. But they found the saddest place in Manhattan, which was Hunter College High School. And this was published out there. So it was being referred to as the saddest school, saddest place. It's very miserable. So the researchers then had a look. What was going on? And the week that they had actually collected the data happened to be the week after spring break. So in Europe and the US, you have the months of, you know, summer holidays, everyone is ecstatic. And they said, well, this makes sense. The first week back from school, no one wants to come back. They'd even interviewed a 14 year old student who said, of course, we don't have any windows. We're under a huge amount of workload and pressure. I'm of course upset. Now the story again could stop there. There was corroboration through anecdotes. It made sense in terms of the time period. But a lot of the students from the community were actually speaking out. The school had won awards. How could it possibly be the saddest place on earth? Now, when they were doing the geolocation of the Twitter feeds, it wasn't quite accurate. It had mostly congregated around the Hunter College High School. They had assumed that was a central focal point because that was the only maybe landmark. But in actual fact, the data was actually coming from an adjacent location to the school and it was coming from one account. So when the principal was interviewed a few weeks after, the researchers acknowledged, they redacted, they updated information, they even made a public apology to turn this all around. The principal said it didn't really impact us too much. We've got ha healthy, happy students. And also, none of our students use Twitter. They use Facebook to raise their concerns. So this is a lovely story in actual fact. Yes, the researchers probably should have actually consulted the humans, the students and the school, rather than just publishing the results. But how it was turned around and publicly acknowledged and that there was many articles more about how the data had turned around versus the saddest school in Manhattan. These are wonderful stories and there's many more. Now, it's not just about doing these manifestos. There is frameworks. And you can imagine our esteemed speaker, Teresa, has actually created one. The pressure's on. <laughs> Um, and I, I won't go into great detail about this here. I am publishing work on this and this, um, I'll put some of those links in there. Uh, what I wanted to, to flag is that again, as some of these other illustrations are showing is, is when, when you locate data uh, in a socio-technical framework, when, when you start to recognize what aspects you might have more in your control and what aspects are beyond your control but will have impact, it, it raises your awareness to, to the way that you can uh, respectfully and appropriately move forward with working with data while also recognizing your limitations. So, so in that, that story that Gerald Thorpe shared about Hunter College, one of the phrases that, that still sticks in my brain that, that, that um, in that work he wrote, he describes that data so often is taken from people, it is so rarely given back to them. So, so in the framework that I've been developing, participatory approaches are absolutely fundamental to this. So if you're going to make claims about people and you're going to use data to represent some aspects of human practice, then quite naturally, one should be drawing on those. Uh, that takes different techniques. It also means working with teams because no one person can potentially have all of that amazing talent. Uh, so, so I'll leave it at that just in the interests of time. Uh, to, to just say there are frameworks, there are ways that, that we can move forward. Um, but there are some other critical um, takeaways that we would love to leave you with before we engage in conversation. Dorothea. Definitely. There's a person that I often quote, and it's uh, Deming. <laughs> some of you may know of him. He started his career actually as an electrical engineer, but moved into information science and more recognized as a statistician. He ended up working into the US um, Department of Labor and Census. And he often gets quoted, you see lots of memes, including this one, where he says, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And many, many leaders, I believe, have used this to their credit to try and create these KPIs and say, we need this. This is what the company's aspiring and this is what we're striving for. However, this is not quite an accurate attribution to Deming. In actual fact, what he had said instead, but people have stripped that away, was, I think it will come up into the next slide slowly and surely, it's wrong 
to suppose that if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. A costly myth. But decades later, we still misappropriate and say, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Now, he's not saying if you can measure something, don't manage it. What he's saying is there's a greater world out there. This is in the early 1900s where he was actually referring to this and it's something very important to recognize and something that we do with our data too. We sometimes strip away what we think is the super superfluous or the unnecessary to get to our core message because it serves our needs. But also that doesn't mean that it should be counted by any means. It can be measured because unfortunately most of what we do in this world, it's numbers which leads on to another wonderful and beautiful quote from William Bruce Cameron, who's also an information scientist, and he wrote a book on information or informal sociology, a casual introduction to sociological thinking. He says there, not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. You would think it came from Zeus, a wonderful poem, but it's not. It actually has lots of beauty in what he's actually referring to. And there is something that happened in Australia, if you recall, in the census results, in the last census results that I thought was rather amusing, where they were talking about the average Australian. And the ABC News overlaid it with, well, let's understand what our politicians, who are meant to be the voice of the people, constitute as the average or typical Australian. And their definitions in terms of the demographic actually did not constitute or was not represented in the census data. The number of people based on those demographics was less than a thousand. So again, words and data are extraordinarily important. Then on a global scale, if anyone follows Davos or the World Economic Forum, like a couple of years ago, there was a panel that unfortunately didn't maybe get as much insight and uh, uh, it wasn't well received by the participants in the group, but it received a lot of insight afterwards. It was around tax. Not a very interesting topic for most people that come into the World Economic Forum. And the panel was trying to indicate that tax is extraordinarily important for in, uh, removing poverty from actually investing in the right initiatives. One person in the participant group actually stands up, ex-CFO of Yahoo, major global organization, and says, you've missed the point. The data says otherwise about tax. You should tell me how we can really handle these big, wicked problems. I can tell you the data shows unemployment in the United States of America is at its lowest. It's at its lowest for black people. It's at its lowest for the youth. In fact, the United States has done so much to remove poverty globally. One of the participants on the panel retorts in a very calm manner. Her name is Winnie. She's from Uganda and she's one of the executives on Oxfam. And she says, what you're counting is wrong. And let me tell you why. There is people in the United States that we work with in this country that you say that the number of unemployment is at its lowest, that work in poultry farms, the ones that pluck the um, feathers of the birds, the ones that unfortunately have to prepare the birds so that you can eat it cleanly in your supermarkets, that wear diapers to work every day because they're not allowed to go and take a toilet break. You're not counting unemployment, you're counting exploitation. You're missing about the dignity of the people. And this is what Teresa and I are trying to bring to light, the importance of data ethics. What is it that you're trying to do? What is it the way that we're trying to move forward? And who are the voices you're really providing for? It's not just about those jobs. And so that's very much, that is in a sense where, where we want to leave some key takeaways uh, with you uh, to talk about ways that we can aspire to be data informed instead of data driven. So we can, we can use the data in powerful ways when we are aware of, of our possible blind sides of, of the possible uh, barriers or the things that we may be missing as, as in that wonderful story um, that, that Dorothea just shared. And I think this is how we can apply our conscience as data practitioners to think about what is visible to whom, when, and for what purpose. Uh, what we can learn from, from the challenges uh, as well as the successes in our local context. So that's that contemplation that I mentioned before. It's, it's learning lessons and, and again, being transparent and open about what has worked and what hasn't worked. And that, and that takes trust. And that's where we're building trust in, and a culture of trust is so critical thinking about who our most vulnerable citizens are 
the ones that 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 are in our charge, the ones that that maybe in our organizations or in our communities need someone to be able to advocate for them. And, and that's not to say to speak for them, but to start to find ways to enable them to speak for themselves, to give them voice and to give their data representation, uh, to think about the most invisible concerns um, within our circles of influence. And to always and ever remain alert to the missing, misrepresented and underrepresented in all of our data gathering processes. With that, we love to close it um, and, and open the floor to questions and say thank you very much. We're, we're delighted to be able to, to give some of these, these um, observations to you and, and hopefully this is the beginning uh, of a series of conversations on this important topic. And thank you again, Veronica and Data for Good for giving us the opportunity to share. Well, thank you, Teresa and Dorotea. That was a, a great discussion and I, I've, I can see we already have questions in, so I'm, I'm very happy that we'll be able to continue it. So just a reminder to participants to use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen to enter, and enter any questions. Um, and we'll start addressing them now. Um, so the first question that we have um, says that among members of not-for-profit think tanks and academia, data is a powerful tool in telling stories, but doesn't seem to be as effective for policymakers and the governments. Um, and it goes on to give examples of government attitudes towards minorities, asylum seekers, um, ignoring data on the climate emergency. So the question is, are there successful case studies on how we go about this challenge and what approaches seem to be the most effective? That's a big question. <laughs> <It is. laughs> We're starting with a tough one. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I'll, I'll start first, and please jump in then, Dorotea, um, as, as, as someone working running data practice uh, in an organization and as a PhD student, I'm sure case studies are, are, are very much in, in her literature. Uh, I, I think one of the obstacles that I see is, is an absence of data literacy. So, so I think building on that is important. Uh, and, and in terms of, of examples of where it might be working, I have to say I'm very, I have been very honored to be a part of conversations in New South Wales government and, and working with uh, chief data uh, experts like Dr. Ian Opperman and members of his team where, where I've seen this real desire to find ways to bring policy workers and, and, and people working in you know, at the coalface with organizations together with, with the data analytics talent to, to see how, how you build those bridges. Um, but I also know having, having been um, able to have some involvement over the last many years that it takes a lot of time. And one of the challenges very often is that policy, uh, policy needs action straight away. And, and that's where some of this fast happens where people work with what I call low hanging data. Uh, so, uh, but, but stay tuned. I, I, I think there are some wonderful exemplars that are coming out of New South Wales and also in Australia in terms of the ways that, that data professionals are, are working in, in places where they, they are uh, learning to speak and uh, not learning to, but using, using their talents and speaking with organizational leaders, speaking with decision makers, uh, and, and not just uh, sticking with, with those areas where, where the data is stored and, and dealing with the analytics people. Dorotea. Can I provide two examples actually just on, on the top of my head? Uh, and by the way, a key thing is the data literacy and interdisciplinary teams. You can't have a group of policymakers. You can't have a group of ex-lawyers. You can't just have a group of data scientists. You need to have that mix to help bring that literacy up. So two examples and one from New South Wales government is when um, Ian Opperman was actually leading the um, data analytics center he was getting data challenges. And one was around how do we minimize the amount of time that fire trucks get given, um, sent off to commercial buildings when someone has inadvertently, unfortunately burnt the toast. It's a very costly exercise. It takes away from real problems and challenges. So they got the data set. And I'm pretty sure this is public knowledge. I'm very sure it's public knowledge. So the, the Data Analytics Center did take the data set 
And what they actually found out was the data from the fire alarm systems was not of the best quality. It unfortunately didn't garner the information that was required. Now, it doesn't stop there. In actual fact, it changed policy on what was the minimum requirement of fire alarm systems and what was the data required to be collected in order to predict in the future. So here's an example of a policy change, not from an insight, but as a result of poor data being collected from maybe legacy systems. So that's New South Wales government. Another one which I really liked was actually in Switzerland when they were trying to actually improve diversity in schools and education systems. And as you know, from a public education system, it's typically catchment area. So where are your kids or where is your house located? And you know that sometimes you as a parent actually move so your kids can be to a better school. But what they decided to do was actually have a look at the diversity of the kids going to every school. And they changed the catchment areas Rather than encouraging people to move or figuring out diversity challenges, they said, what if we slowly change in these particular areas, we will get a much diverse student cohort that enriches their learning experience. And we don't have a monopolization of one language, one type of history, one type of culture. And I thought these are two really nice examples where it had changed in terms of policy. And, and, and there is a number of more, but you see a clear message that there is a story being told that it doesn't just stop with an insight, it's what happens in the future and it's interdisciplinary teams. I hope that answers your question. Oh, that was a fantastic answer. And I, I love that particular call out, the, the importance of the interdisciplinary teams. Um, so the next question that we have are what are some of the systemic challenges organizations have when actually operationalizing data ethics? I, I personally think one of the biggest systemic challenges I see is that it's still seen as a nice to have, not a need to have. So it isn't, it, it is appreciated when there is time to appreciate it, but there's still a battle to be fought to, to have it valued as a line item, so, something that, that is, is important for your business. Uh, and I know this, uh, you know, it breaks my heart. I have some colleagues who are internationally recognized data ethicists who were running units that in, in recent months have, they've just been told, well, they'll be shut down because, you know, the cost margins need to be looked at. And, uh, and I think that just says, well, how, how are you valuing? What are you valuing? And, uh, how, how, do you, how do you ensure that someone recognizes that this is something that can prevent future issues? It, it, it's not about coming in with ethics once you've been called out. Dorothea. That's 100% correct. And that's actually really heartbreaking to hear that it's being shut down, even though companies want to say they're ethical practices, yep. they've got social responsibility. So one thing that I did when I first started in this particular role just over a year ago, was making sure that we had ethical practices, what we call responsible use of data upfront. Everything we do, every experiment, every feature has to go through this almost like as a mini governance point of view. Now, it's not meant to be too onerous. It's actually just meant to be having the discussion to begin with, have we included the community as part of this? Are they aware that they are uh, providing us consent to use the data for these means? What could happen? before we go and produce or release this out there. So it's embedding it into our process and making sure that everyone is responsible. It's not just me and my data scientists and my data analysts, that's not right. It's actually also the people that own the features in the product. It's the people that are providing the data and it's the people that are going to be using that data. So what we've actually done is provided this little bit of a framework and we're still building this out. So full transparency there, it's in the creation of the insights. And then once those insights are created, who provides the data? and who consumes it, they have to sign up to this sort of mini code of conduct. Are they aware of what they are doing? So it's an entire ecosystem. Think about the supplier chain of code of conduct, but aspiring that from a data life cycle point of view. So embedding that from day one, still early stages, but that's the grand vision in, in short. That's how we can ad address it. Uh, yes, it's very devastating to see that, but the only way is sometimes actually saying, what happens if we don't? So sometimes it's not about cost. Sometimes it's not about metrics. It can also be, well, what is the risk? And if you have audit and risk down your back, none of the businesses <laughs> actually want that. So how can we minimize it? And it sort of relates, I think, to the first question, how can we get governments to think about this? 
there is always a lever. And it's sometimes talking about what really makes them tick and how can we get them to be our defiant partners together. <laughs> I've actually, um, you, you've reminded me, Dorothea, one of, one of the most successful strategies I've had for getting people to start to think about data ethics is to use the language of risk mitigation. And the minute you start describing it, well, this is how you mitigate your risk. Oh, I've got a category for that. You know, I, right. <laughs> I, I need to show that I'm doing that. I have a risk register. Uh, and the other, I think the other systemic challenge that I've seen, which is again, one reason I'm working so much in this area of trust building in communities and in organizations is, is the, the fear and the cynicism, particularly as employees. So often in, in order for, for ethical practice to be possible in an organization, you have to feel safe in speaking out as well. And, and if the trust isn't there, that, that you are um, going to be supported in raising, in, <laughs> in making something visible uh, at, without losing your job or with, without being penalized in some way personally. It is really difficult to see that. And we've seen that in governments, we've seen that in organizations, you see that in communities. So, so creating a culture of trust and uh, Dorte and I have, have done a masterclass, we'll, we'll share the link on that. It's, um, it's a loaded topic. Uh, and it's it's not something easy, but I do think that a fundamental culture of trust is really critical for enabling us to deal with some of the uncertainties and to create that that environment within which questions can be raised, even if you can't give an answer. To just be able to raise the question is important, and that takes leadership as well and courage. Excellent. All right, we've got time for a couple of more questions. Um, one that we've got is to do good data, we need to understand bad data and know where to look for it. So would you say that the most common way of misrepresenting data is to change the framing of the data set or changing the scale? So the person is interested in big foods use of obesity, et cetera, data. Any thoughts on that one? How people commonly misuse or misrepresent data? Well, I, I'm, I'm sort of reminded of Mark Twain and the three kinds of lies, lies, damn lies, and statistics. So, uh, so when I used to teach research practice, I used to use the same data set to get people to demonstrate that red wine is good for your health and red wine is bad for your health. So, so good and bad, um, you know, these, these, them, these themselves are loaded words. I, I, I feel that one, one thing that's important is to have diversity uh, not just in terms of the individual working with that data, but to find ways, if you're looking, let's say, at, at, around food and around the values associated with, with health, having, having a, um, an opportunity for participatory engagement in the interpretation of that data is a really valuable way of starting to uncover the different values that are attributed to what, what is known and what is not known. So one person's good data set could be another person's bad data set, uh, because again, these, these are values. So, so in a, a, the way that I have been trained, we use something called value sensitive design, where you're seeking, you, you make a deliberate attempt to find as many different diverse voices and, and uh, different sectors of, uh, for lack of another term, we'll call them stakeholders, uh, people who, who you bring to the table to find a way to understand individually and collectively what, what values you're using, the lenses you're using to interpret something. So, so, so that, I don't know that that completely answers that question, but, but I think it raises a, a, a really big challenge in, in terms of, of what it is that you have in front of you and how, how you are identifying and making judgments. Uh, again, I look at this, so my training is in ethnography. And, and when you're looking at qualitative data, when you're looking at, at, at material that, that in and of itself it is given value very much by, by the person doing the interpretation, you have to, if you're going to be a good ethnographer, if you're going to have your work respected, you need to be able to, to explain and justify how you have come to every conclusion that you line up. So if you're going to say this, this data uh, is, is good for our purposes, so you're talking data quality, well, what are the criteria of quality that you are using? What is the basis on which you are making those judgments about quality? Because again, 
quality is contextual. Uh, so, it, so it's very much about showing your hand and laying that out. And those examples of um, the studies of weather-related deaths, I think those were illustrations that, that did a marvelous job of, of not just presenting their findings, but slowing down the process enough to actually explain how they made those judgments. And, and that's where then you can come together with different perspectives about the same data to say, oh, I judge this as being good because, and then someone else with a different perspective might say, well, from, from what I'm looking at or from what I'm privileging, this is problematic and this is why. So, so again, they're not, they're not fast answers. And that's one of the challenges we have very often because everyone wants it yesterday. And, and these things, quality takes time. And so again, getting that valued, getting the time that it needs sufficiently valued so that that is privileged is critical as well. All right, I'm gonna try and squeeze in one last question because we're getting very close to our time. And I think this one is for you, Dorothea, um, but it comes back to that point of we have to think of the people behind the data. So we've had a question. Um, did anyone follow up on what happened to that person with the Twitter account? And I think that's in relation to the uh, story you told about the school. It's a fantastic question. And unfortunately, I don't know uh, what the follow up is, but actually we had an internal conversation about something very similar. Um, for instance, when lease where I work, it's about property and construction. So what if we find out that the temperature is just uncommonly hot? It's not just about saying that it's uncommonly hot. Are we taking care that there is not an OHS issue? Have we actually resulted in dehydration of people? Have they been hospitalized? So we should always be including that as part of the message. But thank you. This is really inspiring to see that we've actually seen ethical data use and inspiration as part of the conversation. But you know what? I'm going to follow up after this and do my research. Awesome, thank you. So we are at the end of our hour. Um, so I hope all of our participants join me in thanking both of our speakers for that wonderful conversation. Teresa and Dorothea, you were both inspirational and you know, I love your work. I've very much enjoyed the conversation today. So again, thank you to all our participants for posing such interesting questions and we hope to see you again at our next event. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye and thank you. Thank you.